Okay, I'm going to continue my discussion of the future and illusion. Um, I, I just want to f say a few words about Chapter 3. In Chapter 3, Freud went over the development of religion from the humanizing of nature through the development of science, and then as science developed uh, religious religion, its basic uh, uh, reason for existing became more of one of, of uh, making sure that justice was done uh, in the world rather than uh, changing nature. Because what happened, at, at science when science uh, became developed, uh, the laws of, of, of physics uh, became more important than the, 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 the gods. And the gods were now subject to the, the laws of physics, gravity, and so on. So what happened, Freud says, is that religion became more concerned with making sure that justice ultimately would be done. And the only way that was going to happen was that it would have to happen after death, because in this world, people's uh, justice is not, not done. Many good people live and they die, and many bad people prosper, and justice is never going to be done. So the only way justice is ultimately going to be, be uh, uh, achieved is after death. And so basically what happens, Freud says, is that a religious system is created, and he's talking about the Judeo-Christian view, and uh, what happened is that monotheism came into being, which he credits to the Jews. Freud himself is Jewish. He was a Jewish atheist, but he was still Jewish. And so what he says is that the Jews were the ones who turned the many gods of paganism into one god. And Freud has a, a kind of an interesting psychological explanation for why the Jews are... God's chosen people. <clears throat> and the way he puts it is this, kind of a psychoanalytic uh, or a psychological uh, explanation. Basically, Freud says that, uh, at the end of chapter 3 is that uh, because the Jews were the ones who uh, are responsible for the development of monotheism, the idea that God is one, Freud says they were proud of that, the, that achievement. And they said to God, you know, he said, look at God, uh, we made you God. Uh, before before us, uh, there were many gods, so you're just one of many. Uh, but you owe to us the fact that you are the supreme god. You're the one god, and so we want something. You know, we want something in return. And so for, that's how Freud explains why they're the chosen people. God said, "Oh, okay, uh, you you can be my chosen people," and the Jews were happy with that. Anyway, that's kind of a, you might think that's kind of a crazy idea, and I don't think anybody take that, takes that seriously. But anyway, that's, that's Freud's psychological explanation for why the Jews are God's chosen people. But anyway, let me briefly go over the, the developed monotheistic system that Freud says <clears throat> is what uh, <clears throat> has dominated uh, the world for uh, at least a Western culture for a couple thousand years. And that's the idea of this. So, but basically, there are two worlds. There's this world... And the uh, and the next world, uh, you know, after death. Um, and this is kind of you, you might be familiar to. It's probably familiar to you from Plato because Plato had a similar idea. It's a, it's not exactly a, like Plato, a Plato, but it's similar in the sense that there are two worlds. Um, and according to the system, this religious system, Judeo Christianity, which most of us are familiar with, just about everybody is. There's we have a soul and a body. Um, the body dies, and when the body dies, the soul goes to the next world. So the soul is immortal. Um, in this world here, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of injustice. Um, so justice is never done down here. Now, the only way justice is going to be done is if it can't, it's not going to be done down here because people die and they're dead. And uh, if they suffered unjustly, think of the Holocaust, for example. I mean, the six million Jews that died in the Holocaust are dead. Now, if justice, is, if they're ever going to have justice, it's got to be after death. So the system is basically this. There's one God who looks over the whole system. And this one God is a good God. 
And basically, he he's going to ensure that justice is done. Now, not only is does God have to be omniscient, he has to know everything, he has to be good, but he's also got to be omnipotent. He's got to be all-powerful, because only a very powerful God is able is going to be able to pull this off. Um, he's going to have to resurrect people from the dead. He's going to have to be able to consign some people to heaven and some people to hell. So basically, in the system, there is a heaven and a hell. And God is in charge of the whole system. Um, and this God is ultimately in charge of the moral law. And he is ultimately, um, his main purpose is to ensure that justice is done. I mean, basically, he has our, our interests at heart. He, he cares about people. He loves people. And he's a God of justice and righteousness. This is a Jewish Christian view. And Freud says, Freud doesn't believe any of it. But he, he's just presenting the view. Um, so this is the view. And he says the Jews were the ones who were responsible for this. And again, as I mentioned before, it's because they were responsible for it that they wanted something in return. You know, they say, we made you God. You know, the, for Freud, from, from Freud's standpoint, since he's an atheist, he doesn't believe there really is a God. Um, but at least they they believe there's a god so they wanted something in return and so they 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 wanted god to be you know consider them their chosen people his chosen people okay so that's chapter three basically um that's the religious view this is this is the religious view that when going back to you know when we were talking in in the very first chapter about civilization being at war you know, civilization uh, in the first chapter, Freud says, is surrounded by enemies. You know, one is nature. Nature is an enemy. And the other enemy are individual people. And remember, civilization had to make a deal with these, with us. And because of the taboos, the three taboos against incest, cannibalism, and murder, uh, because all people, Freud says, want to do these things, um, they hate civilization and they want to destroy it. And so civilization has to, has to find a way to make peace with these individuals. And it does so by offering the four mental assets, or I call them bribes or gifts, and they are, uh, I'll meant to mention them again, morality or conscience. He gives, uh, civilization gives people a conscience so that they will want actually to do the, perform the moral law. Then there's ideals, which builds up their self-esteem. There's morality, which allows them to basically to, to uh, enjoy the taboo desires, but vicariously. And then the final one is religion, which gives them victory over death, immortality. And that's what Freud is talking about in chapter three, the, the religious system that the Jews were responsible. They created monotheism. They were the ones who made God, God. And they were the ones who, who created the system where God will ensure justice is done after death. And through creating heaven and hell. Okay, that's the religious system. Now, Freud, this is the best that civilization could offer individual people, the religious system that the Jews were responsible for creating. Now, it's Freud says it's a beautiful system. Freud would say, Freud says he would love it to be true, except he doesn't believe it's true. He's going to argue in the next couple chapter that it's an illusion. But he says, you know, I would I would love it to be true. It just he doesn't believe it is. So this is the religious system, and what he's going to be in the next couple chapter well, is from chapters five and six. He's going to be arguing that when he actually opens up the present of religion, he opens it up, and he will see it's empty. The whole. Problem one was civilization has to do something to survive because it's surrounded by enemies. And the solution one to problem one was it gave individual, it gave everyone these four uh, mental assets, these four gifts, morality, ideals, 
re art and religion. The best is religion. And so people shake. They make a deal with civilization. They say, yeah, wow, we'll take this stuff. This is great. We'll obey you. We'll be uh, faithful members of civilization because we get these four things in return. And Freud is going to argue that one, the best gift that civilization has to offer us actually is a trick. There's nothing there. Okay, now I want to go to talk a little about, I'm going to skip chapter four because chapter four basically, it is interesting. I'll, I'll just brief, basically mention what happens in chapter four. In chapter four, there's a person that enters the, Freud introduces what he calls the opponent. And the opponent will come back every so often in the book. Basically, the opponent is a rhetorical device that Freud uses. Uh, it's a character and who asks questions. You know, he asks questions, Freud's questions. It's like he's skeptical about some of the stuff Freud says. Basically, the opponent is a way for Freud uh, to, you know, to voice the concerns of the reader. As you read the book, you might have some questions. You might have some questions. So he puts those questions that you might have into the mouth of the opponent. And some of the questions are actually questions that Freud himself might have and that he thinks are worth answering. So basically the opponent is a rhetorical, a rhetorical device which allows Freud to, to take up some questions that the reader, you know, that you and me or people reading the book uh, might have. At the end of chapter four also it's very important because Freud uh, succinctly states, I think probably one of the best places in the book, what his view about religion. Basically religion for Freud is infantile. It's based upon an infantile model. You know, when you were a child, you were a little kid and, and your father was God and your father could solve all your problems. When you grow up, you know, now you're the adult, but con confronted with nature, you're still like totally helpless. And now, so you need a consoling figure to take care of your problems. And since there is no uh, controlling, uh, uh, consoling figures around who can actually help you, you create God. Freud says we create God. The, the God whom we dread is the God we create. Um, we, we create a father figure that can solve our problems. So Freud, that's Freud's view of religion. It's, it's childish. Okay, that's basically how he looks at it. Uh, it's because we are totally helpless. It can, 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 uh, going back to the, 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 from chapter one, you've got civilization and you've got nature over here and you've got the individual here. Basically, we are always children uh, in, con confronted with nature, we are, we are helpless. And we need a consoling father figure and that we create God. That's Freud's view. Okay, so now I want to say something about chapter 5, which is very important because in chapter 5, Freud, for the first time, introduces the distinction between science and religion. And basically, the distinction is very, it's very simple. Re science for Freud is the only way we can know about reality because it's based upon reason and evidence and testing hypotheses. It's not based upon faith. Freud says, if you ask a scientist, any, any scientist, you know, why do you believe that evolution is true? Why do you believe that the Big Bang happened 13.5 billion years ago? Why do you believe that E equals MC squared? Why do you believe in quantum mechanics? Uh, what Freud says what science will say is, we, we don't ask you to believe any of this stuff. If you don't believe quantum physics, you know, we're not asking you to take our word for it. If you want to know why we think science, uh, why we think that quantum uh, mechanics is true, uh, uh, you can know, but you're, it's going to take a lot of work. You're going to have to study some, a lot of mathematics, a lot of physics. But if you follow, if you start from the beginning and work your way through, by the end of the, uh, you know, after maybe 20 years of study, you'll know for yourself. You won't have to take it on faith. So basically, Freud says, science never asks for belief. It, it, it doesn't ask for belief. There's no authority in science. It says, if you don't believe us, go and look. On the other hand, in the next video, I have to pursue this more. But religion, he says, if you ask uh, religion, you know, why, why should we believe, you know, what you tell us? Uh, Freud says, they're never going to give you evidence. It's all, they're going to be asking always for faith. You know, believe us, you know, take us on our word. You said, but I want evidence. I want to see it, you know, with my own eyes. And Freud says religion cannot, cannot give you that type of evidence. That's Freud's view of religion and science. Science is based on fact and it will give you proof. Religion asks for faith and it cannot justify itself. 
In the next lecture, I will pursue this more and go into more of the details from Chapter 5. Uh, but that's all for now, um, and I'll continue it in the next uh, lecture.